Good morning, church. It's so good to see you here today. We have a lot of guests in here today. We have a lot of guests many Sundays. We welcome you. We love you. We love our community. We're all about reaching out to our community in the name of Jesus Christ and doing it in many practical ways to show the love of God. I appreciate so many people in here that are part of various ministry teams in this church, uh, and we just appreciate you so much. Uh, yesterday, we had a team, at, we have a canal day here in Newport, and uh, we had a booth that actually did some work to raise some money for the Brand Life Outreach. Normally, we don't raise money, we spend it, you know, <laughs> for the ministry that we do. But they raised $2,000 yesterday, and we really just appreciate you. I mean, they put a long day in setting up in the rain and all kinds of things and cooking hamburgers and hot dogs and, and all that kind of stuff. That whoopie pies were like a picking car tire. You know, I mean, it's, wow, they were fantastic. But thanks to all of you who really sacrificed, who really got, you know, got wet and just served the Lord in, in doing that. And you are so much appreciated. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would just minister each one of us here today. Uh, the Apostle Paul called this the foolishness of preaching. Somehow, you through your Holy Spirit find a way to minister to each of us wherever we are in the walk of life. And I'm just trusting you, God, to do that today because we're gonna talk about your word and your word has the power to transform us. And so, God, we give ourselves to you. We open our minds to you. And we ask that you would just speak to us this day through your word in Jesus' name. Everyone said, Amen. we're going to talk today about treasure in jars of clay. A few years ago, a brother and a sister in West London found an old vase while cleaning out their parents' home, and they thought it might have some value. Subsequently, they hired Bainbridge, which was an auction house, to sell it, and they discovered it was valued at nearly $2 million. But get this, after 30 minutes of spirited bidding at the auction. This vase, which turned out to be an 18th century Qing Dynasty vase, went to a buyer from China for more than $69 million. I mean, the most ever paid for a Chinese antiquity. A Bainbridge uh, spokeswoman said they had no idea what they had. And when the final bid was official, they had to go out of the room and have a breath of fresh air. Ah, uh, yeah, so. Um, maybe some of us should uh, spend time cleaning out our attic, you know, our garage. Um, my wife and I like to watch the Antique Roadshow, and in virtually every program, someone discovers that a piece of furniture picked up at an estate sale for 18 bucks turns out to be worth 50 grand, or 100 grand if they hadn't touched up the original finish. Um, I remember a parish priest, a Father McLeod in England, who bought an old painting for 400 pounds. And he found it in a local antique shop and purchased it mainly because he liked the gold frame around it. And the picture showing a Brussels magistrate turned out to be a Van Dyke, painted in 1634. He paid 400 pounds, the actual value, 400,000. I don't ever expect to be on that program looking for an, an appraisal of one of my antiquities. I'm more likely to be the poor guy who sold the thing to someone for 20 bucks, <laughs> not realizing its value. But the fact is, it's not unusual for treasure to be found in strange places, even clay pots. In 1947, a little Bedouin boy was throwing rocks up to a cave in the rugged, on a rugged cliff within sight of the Dead Sea. And he heard sounds of breaking pottery. And that led to the discovery of the greatest literary treasure ever, the Dead Sea Scrolls. And that find included copies of every Old Testament book except Esther, all dated more than a thousand years earlier than any copy previously available. The point, things aren't always what they seem at first glance or on the surface. Often, we need to dig deeper to, to look at something from another perspective to discover the true value of it. And that's one of the very important lessons to come out of the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians. And this morning, 
I point, you, point your attention to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And the topics of the Corinthian letters sound like they could have been written to the churches of today. So in 2 Corinthians 4 and, and chapter 1, Paul is defending his own ministry. I mean, there were some Corinthians that had been challenging his authority. And in this second letter, he's explained to them why he does certain things. And the fourth chapter is a wonderful passage because eventually it explains the power of, of a, and secret of a true Christ-honoring life and ministry. He writes in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 1, Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways that do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age, or, or Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Now, that is the context. That is the background for what we're gonna look at today. So now I'm going to begin to unpack this chapter, beginning in verse number seven. And here, Paul explains genuine Christianity. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 7. Read aloud with me here, church. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. From Paul's perspective, this is the equivalent of buying priceless heirlooms at a yard sale for next to nothing. I mean, he is gobsmacked with the realization that the Holy Spirit lives in him and that God has called him to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there are several important factors about this verse, and it gives us a description of genuine humanity. I mean, humanity as God intended it to be. First of all, mankind is described as jars. And this is not the only place that this metaphor occurs in scripture. It's a very significant figure. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought of yourself as a vessel or a jar, but it's a fundamental and essential concept of the scriptures with regard to the human race. What are jars for? I think we would all agree that jars are made to contain something. That's their sole purpose. They're designed and shaped to be filled with something. And that's why this verse is so significant. It reminds us that we human beings were made to be vessels, jars, pots, made to contain something, to hold something. The vessels in your own home, pots, cups, bowls, are made to hold something. And if they do not have that substance in them, they are, of course, empty. And so it's no accident that God views lives without Jesus Christ as empty lives because that's what we were created to contain. It's no accident that the world today is suffering from what, from what Dr. Carl Jung calls a neurosis of emptiness. He says, when goal goes, meaning goes. When meaning goes, purpose goes. When purpose goes, life goes dead on our hands. This is what's happening in many hearts and lives today, both young and old alike. There is a great wave of emptiness, of despair. And the result is hollow men and women who have a facade of interest, attention, and activity, but within there's just all this emptiness. That emptiness is what is creating the restlessness, which is so characteristic of our age and which often results in rebellion and reaction or withdrawal and depression. The scripture indicates this significant element about humanity. We are made to be vessels, made to hold something. 
And if we do not have that something in there, our lives are inevitably empty and meaningless. So mankind is described as jars, but there's more. Mankind is described as jars of clay. That is, made from clay, a very common material, which has limited value in and of itself. And, and here, of course, is the concept with which so many struggle today and which the secularist and the humanist vigorously reject. They say that man is the substance of all things. He is his own God. But the word of God takes a very humbling and realistic approach to mankind and says that by ourselves, we're just bits of clay. Of course, there are all kinds and grades of clay. Some of you are rather fine china. You have a very fine texture, but you crack easily. But, but fine china is still nothing more than clay. Others of, others of us are more like sun-dried mud, and we crumble at the first knock that comes along. But bottom line, Paul describes us as jars of clay earthen vessels of various textures. But then notice how the picture here is completed. Mankind in Christ is described as jars of clay filled with a treasure. In the, in the Christian life, the apostle says, we have a treasure in those jars of clay. And he describes it as all surpassing power or transcendent power, it says in some of your translations. This is the glory of the Christian life. This is humanity as God intended it to be. The vessel cannot fulfill its purpose in and of itself, but is designed to hold a treasure that is priceless. It's a treasure so valuable that the world would give everything it has to get it if it understood what it's all about. Throughout the rest of this week, there will be huge amounts of money expanded trying to discover this treasure, this all-surpassing power, this key, something that would unlock the fulfillment in a human being. Billions of dollars are poured out, poured out every week in a vain attempt to satisfy the desires of the human heart. But they're looking for treasure in all the wrong places. Walter Percy writes in his book, Lost in the Cosmos, it is a treasure because it is a power a transcendent power. You know what transcendent means. It is something beyond the ordinary. It is something above ourselves, something wholly other, something different, unusual. It's not like the ordinary kind of power that we think of, which tears things apart, which destroys and blasts and breaks. This is a strange kind of power, a kind which unites, it harmonizes, it gathers, it breaks down barriers. In other words, here is the power to change a life or a society from within, not from without. It does not make superficial external adjustments, changing the outward face of things, but a genuine transformation which arises from within, which completely and permanently changes an individual. And as individuals become changed, the society of which they are a part likewise becomes changed. Folks, if you're putting all your money on politics to change our world, you are gonna be really disappointed. Folks, there's nothing like this in the world. The gospel has no rivals whatsoever. There is no other philosophy or approach to life which can compare with it. It's completely unique. It is so tremendous because it has the power to really transform men and women and boys and girls. You can imitate this power. You can dress it up on the outside and mimic what it's supposed to look like. And for a time, you can produce something which resembles it and which may temporarily fool you and others. But sooner or later, its real character becomes evident to all as it cannot stand the tests which are applied to real Christianity. What Paul speaks of is not something fake. It's not phony. It's genuine transformation, a permanent and ongoing change within an individual. And the secret, as many of you well know, is Christ 
alive in us. Colossians 1, 26. I like the message version of this. This mystery has been kept in the dark for a long time. Now it's in the, out in the open. God wanted everyone, not just Jews, to know this rich and glorious secret inside and out, regardless of their background, regardless of their religious standing. The mystery, in a nutshell, is this. Read it with me, church. Christ is in you. Therefore, you can look forward to sharing in God's glory. It's that simple. That is the substance of our message. Well, that's true Christianity, Christ in you. Not Christ showing up at some future date to take you to heaven when you die. That's good. But to manifest his life in you right now, to live his life in you right now with you in terms of all your situations, in terms of all the circumstances of life. This is the treasure. And God put this treasure in failing, faulty, weak, and sinful men and women in order that it might be evident that the power does not originate in us. I should have got more amens than that. Yeah. It's not a result of a strong personality or an extroverted nature or a highly honed, trained mind. It's not a result of any of these things. It's something which arises from the presence of God in the heart, in the soul. And that's why God so delights to call people like us into his kingdom, the foolish, the weak, the faulty, the failing, the incomplete. It's to manifest his love and his grace to us. In the next two verses, Paul explains the challenges to overcome. I mean, the apostle Paul was thrilled to share the gospel. God used him, God will use us to share the good news with people in our sphere of influence. He may send some of us into other lands and other cultures, like Paul. Bottom line, many people believed and were transformed and many churches were started. But some people didn't like what God was doing. Does that kind of sound familiar today? I, I mean, Paul felt the brunt of their displeasure, but the rest of the church also received significant pushback. And Paul wrote of his feelings in very real and raw terms. He says in verse eight, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. Hard pressed here, or afflicted, troubled in the King James, multiple pressures uh, come upon us, not just in one area at a time, but on every side. Have you ever had a sinus headache where it seemed like every part of your head hurt? Everything, I mean, it was like pressure everywhere. It felt like your head's in a vice. And that's the term, this term speaks of discomfort from multiple sources. Your washing machine breaks down. The car won't start. You have relationship challenges. Here comes a pink slip at work. Sickness in your family. Heartbreak comes. Grief comes. These are normal trials of life which come almost daily to everyone. However, sometimes they tend to run in bunches and become overwhelming. It's just one thing after another. Can you relate? Perplexed to be without resources to be in a confused state of mind, to be at a loss, to be in doubt, to be uncertain. It refers to all the pressing calls for decisions when we don't know what to decide. We're at a loss. We can't see the end. We don't know how it's going to turn out. We are afflicted with fears and anxieties and worries and uncertainties. Persecuted. It means to make, to run, or flee, to put the flight, to drive away. Most of the time in the New Testament, it means to harass, trouble, or attack someone, especially because of their beliefs. These are the misunderstandings that we all run up against, the ostracisms, the cold shoulders, which are shown to us at times, the malicious actions and attitudes, the deliberate slights and attacks on our character and our reputation. Just mention a position on morality based on the Bible today, and you will be attacked. You will get it. They won't discuss the subject with you. They'll result to name calling, which prohibits any meaningful debate. 
Struck down means cast down, means to strike with sufficient force, so as to knock down, throw down, strike down. And it happened to Paul literally, considering all the physical violence directed his way. But in its figurative sense, it happens to us when we get the wind knocked out of our sails, when we take a hit, when something throws us for a loop. At times, we experience devastating circumstances that we just don't bounce back from right away. Stunning, shattering blows, which just drop out of the blue into our lives. Accidents, fatal illnesses, war, earthquake, famine, riot. I mean, these terrible episodes can strike a family or an individual and leave us frightened and, and baffled. But note the reaction. I love this. We are hard pressed on every side. What? But not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. The message paraphrase uh, renders Paul's words in, in our current street language. It, it reads, we've been surrounded and battered by troubles, but we're not demoralized. We're not sure what to do, but we know that God knows what to do. We've been spiritually terrorized, but God hasn't left our side. We've been thrown down, but we haven't broken. Why? Because there's a power within. There's an all-surpassing, transcendent power, different from anything else, which keeps pushing back with greater pressure than that whatever comes at us from the outside. Sometimes we feel alone, but we're not alone. Jesus said to his disciples and us in Matthew 28, verse 20, read it, church, surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I mean, in the natural order, we would be wiped out by all this conflict and pressure and threats and blows. But here's what Jesus says to his followers. Read, church, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Woohoo! I mean, Jesus never told us that life would be easy. Becoming a Jesus follower is not like joining the red carpet club, you know, where we kind of drift through life without problems or cares or concerns. Believers experience all the pressures common to man. The pressures are all there, but we don't face them alone. We have a treasure, an all-surpassing power in us. I mean, we need to thank God for this treasure. Let's thank him for this treasure. Man, that was amazing. Woo. I, I think every one of us who has walked with Jesus Christ for any period of time has experienced how Christ can undergird us in times of sorrow and strain, in times of trial and trouble. How do you explain it? I don't know. It's just there's this lifting that's taking place inside of us. There's a lifting, and we know that he's there. So now, Paul explains how we can continuously experience this overcoming lifestyle. And you gotta hang with me on this one here. The apostle gives us two pointers in verses 10 and 11. First, an inner attitude to which we must consent. And it says, we always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. And then there's an outward activity to which we are exposed. Verse 11, for we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. Let's drill down on this a little bit. Notice the word always in both verses, always. Paul says, we always carry around in our body the death of Jesus. What does he mean by that? What is he saying? Paul says, it has to do with the dying of Jesus, the cross of Jesus. The key to experiencing the life of Jesus begins with the understanding of the significance of the death of Jesus. That's key. Twice he mentions it in these verses. What's the significance of the cross? The cross of Jesus had only one purpose. It was to bring to an end an evil man. Now, that may be unusual to say about Jesus because we do not usually think of him as an evil man.
But remember that scripture says in this very little letter, 2 Corinthians 5.21, for he made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Wow. He was sinless. He became our sin bearer on the cross. When he became what we are, there was nothing else for the Father to do except to put him to death. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. He brought him to an end, and in so doing, Christ paid the penalty for our sin, yours and mine. But understand, his death offers the potential for the transformation of our lives. But that transformation occurs as the shadow of the cross of Christ falls upon our lives. The cross puts to death the proud ego, the element within us which, when we do good, wants to blow a trumpet so everyone can hear. Or when there's an opportunity to show off, it makes us eager to get in line. It's that faculty which struggles to be the center of my life and expresses itself in self-excuse and self-pity and self-indulgence and self-assertion. It's the ego which seeks constantly to be ministered to. This is what the cross desires to put to death in us. And the secret of experiencing the life of Jesus is an attitude which welcomes the cross and consents to having the ego crucified within us to be put to death. And to the degree that we do that, then the life of Jesus becomes manifest. It shines out. Are you with me? Now look again at verse 11. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. It's a bit different from verse 10. Verse 10 is an attitude we accept to which we consent. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus. But verse 11 is in the passive voice. This is the kind of action in which we are the object. We are always being given over to death. And this refers to those circumstances and trials and pressures that are common to life that God allows us to experience, which force us to lean upon Jesus. Listen, folks, in a world where free choice exists, God gives us all free choice. But in a world like that, God must allow the consequences of free choice to exist. And that's where the rub comes in, huh? Life can become very messy and painful at times on a planet that is, is in rebellion against its creator. We make poor choices. Others close to us or in a position of authority over us make poor choices. And the ceiling comes down on the guilty and the innocent alike. During those times, we feel like we're being sentenced to death. And that's how Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians 1 verse 8. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the hardships we suffered in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, in our hearts, look at that, we felt, what, the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Folks, that's why we get in trouble That's why pressures come. That's why problems arise in our lives. They're going to happen because we live in a broken world. But, folks, that's why it seems like we can never get everything worked out. I mean, on those rare occasions when you seem to get all the problems taken care of and you settle back, what happens? Bang! You know, another problem arises. You're being delivered up to death in order that you might trust in the one who dwells within, not only in happy circumstances, not only in pleasant surroundings, but in all circumstances. Back to verse 11. The life of the Lord Jesus is made manifest in your what body? Mortal body, not immortal body. This is not talking about heaven. The Holy Spirit works through the scripture and also through the circumstances of our life to teach us 
attitudes that we're to have to bring us to the place where the treasure within may break out and men and women may see it and be blessed and be strengthened. That's why Paul says in Romans 8, 36, and he's quoting Psalm 44 here. He says, as it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. 1 Corinthians 15, 31, Paul says, I die every day. With Paul, is every day. Rarely do any of us in the Western world experience what Paul experienced. I know some people in other cultures and other worlds who do experience it. But this is the process that God uses to shape us and refine us and transform us in his image. Then listen to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 12. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. Here's what Paul's saying. I'm a clay pot. I am weak and vulnerable. I'm not a superhero. I can be broken. I'm fragile. If you examine my life, you won't find a guy who lives a life of ease. You'll find a battered, wounded, and desperately tired man. I, I'm not overwhelmed, but I'm a poor, cracked pot that's been badly abused. But listen, I know without a doubt that God is with me and sustaining me, and out of the cracks of my brokenness, something wonderful happens. Life leaks out. I'm being transformed to be more like Jesus, and others around me are also being blessed by the power of the Holy Spirit being released through me. Here's one of the more incredible oxymorons of Scripture. Matthew 16, verse 24. Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for me will find it. Here's what he meant. Jesus says, come to me. And every day, we're gonna work on that ego problem that you have. We're gonna work on that self-interest and that self-protection and that self-comfort. We're gonna work on that every day in the classroom of life. But in that dying to self, God causes this treasure, the life of Christ, this all-surpassing power to come alive in you. You will be transformed. And in the process, you will comfort, you will encourage other people and salvation will come to many people around you. Paul is saying, we die, you live. We experience problems, persecution, battering, hurt, hatred. Through our brokenness, the life of God flows out to you. Of course, it started, it started with the cross of Christ. He's our example. But church, think about this. The only reason why the life of God came to you was that someone died to themselves to minister to you. Someone took the time. They sacrificed a hobby. They sacrificed some other time. They could have done something else to talk to you. Someone put to death the desire to sleep or to do something else. They prayed for you. Some youth leader refused to spend all their time and energy for themselves and their family, but gave that time and affection to you, and the life of God came through it. Some family member or friend spent time with you, walked you through a lot of ups and downs and didn't give up on you until you found Christ. And that's the reason for Paul's power. Both the death and the life of Jesus were simultaneously working in Paul. This is kind of mystical, but it's how it was every day. He's pressing into Christ. He's dying to self and Christ is being made alive in and through him. What did Paul write to the Philippians? Philippians 3.10. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his suffering, becoming like him in his death. But look at results. Paul says to the Galatians, Galatians 2.20, my old self has been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Wow. 
The life of Christ was clearly manifested through Paul. People could see that he had learned in whatever state he was in to be content. He knew how to be abased. He knew how to abound. Why? Because he had treasure in a jar of clay. Many today are obsessed. Worship team, if you would come, please. Many today are obsessed with finding meaning and purpose. And our culture just bombards us with options. Find a better job, live in a nicer neighborhood, have a trimmer body, travel abroad, have designer clothes, prestigious automobile, beachfront condo. The list goes on and on. And we buy self-help books and get in on the latest fad and buy tons of lottery tickets. I mean, we wait to meet Mr. or Mrs. Wright, believing all the time that somewhere, sometime, somehow, if we position ourselves just right, we're going to be fulfilled. And listen, church, many of those things that I mentioned are okay and actually could be the result of the blessing of God upon our lives. But we will become very disappointed and never truly fulfilled if we view gaining those kinds of things as the objective and the priority of our life. When Paul says we have this treasure in jars of clay, he's saying that meaning and purpose and yes, happiness cannot be found somewhere out there. Someone said, happiness is an inside job. Wealth and fame and the pursuit of the American dream may temporarily satisfy some of our cravings, but they will never give us the feeling of contentment and a sense of purpose and meaning for our lives. The longer you have lived, the more you will recognize this fact. Seniors, do I hear an amen? As someone else has said, it's not what you own, it's what owns you that counts. The Bible teaches we are God's depositories for his treasure, yet we are fragile and breakable and easily damaged. Perhaps some of you feel like a jar of clay that's been chipped or cracked, or broken. Someone has thrown a rock and shattered something inside of you. Look at yourself. Are you perplexed? Do you feel yourself being struck down in life, or persecuted, or hard-pressed, or simply failing again? Do you have doubts? Are you thinking of giving up? At the beginning of every trial or challenge, we so often feel fragile and fear that we'll crumble. But if you're a believer in Jesus, remember the treasure inside you. Remember who dwells within you. And as you cling to the treasure of his presence, you will discover the risen Lord entering your death and resurrecting you to new life. And the power of Christ will shine in your life and through your life and be a blessing to others. And I close with the words Paul uses to conclude this chapter. He says in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16, Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our, get this, light and momentary troubles. It's the guy who wrote most of his books in a prison. For our light and momentary troubles, are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Folks, this morning, some of you are shot up, you know, some of you are broken. And we all go through times like that in our life. But this morning, I just feel like God wants to help us to, to take a step of faith that will help us to start making our problems productive. I'm coming and saying, God, here I am. I humbly submit myself to you. And God, I, you know, I got this wayward family member 
or I got this financial problem, or I, I have this struggle in my life I can't seem to overcome, or I, I have this problem, I have that problem, I, I don't know where to turn. I'm so depressed. I'm so sick of being sick. I'm so tired of being tired. And, and here we are. But maybe this morning, you would come to an old-fashioned altar. And I believe that's essential at this point this morning. I do. I believe it's a step of faith that's going to bring us to a place where we say, God, here I am. It's going to take some effort on our part. And someone's going to be the first one to do it. And then it's going to be like prime of the pump. Others are going to come. Let's stand to our feet, shall we, please? Thank you. This morning, do you want God to minister to you? Do you want to make your problems productive? Who's going to be the first one that's going to come? Because we're going to come this morning. God, has to, God wants to do something in your life. I feel that so strongly. I felt that before I came in here today. God wants to touch people today. He wants us to lay these things down and say, God, please, I have this treasure in me. God, work through, work in my life, transform me. God, help me to turn some of these things around where I'm just not looking at the problem, but I'm looking at the solution to the problem. God, where I'm starting to sense that treasure that's inside of me. It's, it's, it's welling up inside of me. It's doing a work in me. And God, I surrender to that, even though I feel like I'm dying on the outside. God, do that work. Do that work in our lives this day. Randy, if you'd lead us in worship, we're just going to believe God. Just, if you feel to come, please come. Let God minister to you. I'm not going to prolong things. I'm just sharing what God laid on my heart. Let God do work in your life this morning. Man. God knows nothing, nothing matters more than your all. I leave. Nothing matters more to me. Nothing, nothing, nothing matters more. That's it. Just respond to God this morning. Just respond to Him. Yes, God. You are God. Yes, yes, God.
Father, that's our prayer. Whether here at the altar, maybe many are making an altar where they are in their seats or watching on the other side of the cameras this morning. God, we recognize you're the key to life. We have a treasure. It's inside of us. A lot of good things outside, family, friends, meaningful work. There's a lot of good things that we're surrounded with. But unless you're central, unless you're the core of who we are, we're never going to find the kind of life that you created us to have. You're not a crutch. You're the essential part of life. You're the building block of life. God, I pray this morning for people who may not know you. They may hear these words and say, man, that sounds strange. But inside of you, even as you've heard these words, there's something quickening in you. There's something happening. There's something going on there. Uh, That's the Spirit of God pulling you, drawing you. And you can respond to him and become a child of God by just saying, Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me my sin. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And God, make me alive in you. Help me to recognize the treasure that I have inside of me. And God, help me now to grow as a child of God. And Lord, we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for being here today and touching our lives. God, we ask that you would help us to meditate upon these words this week. Maybe as we face this trial or that trial, let me just come back and may its reality grip our hearts. In Jesus' name I pray. And everyone said, Amen. Thanks for being here today.